Well, greetings, Louisville Church of Christ. My name is Lance Levins. I am the preaching minister for the Church of Christ in Champions. We're located in Houston, Texas. And while I have never personally had the opportunity to be at the congregation there at Louisville, uh, we do have a relationship with you as a church. Our young people uh, for many years have attended T3, and I know that that event has been a blessing to our youth group and to many others as well. My wife and I were certainly looking forward to being with you in person this year, but obviously we find ourselves just in the middle of a very unique situation and even a unique time in history. And I'm grateful for your shepherds and for their decision uh, to look out for the safety of the congregation there, but not just for y'all's safety, but also even for the safety for me and for my wife. So while we can't be there in person, we are excited to be a part of your summer series with you this year. And we'll use this incredible avenue of technology uh, to communicate with you and to participate in this uh, series together with you. Now, while I said I, I don't have a history per se with the Louisville congregation, uh, I do want to extend my thanks to Jeff uh, for his invitation to be a part of the summer series, to your shepherds for allowing me to participate as well. Now, I have benefited greatly from a lot of the work that Jeff and his brother Dale have done uh, in just helping to support preachers. I've attended some of their uh, preacher training workshops, and they've certainly been a blessing to me. But it's an honor to be with you tonight, and I'm looking forward uh, to our time together as we study from God's Word. Now, one of the things that my wife and I like to do is we like to look at these house shows on HGTV. And now maybe you're familiar with some of them. We've watched shows like House Hunters and uh, the Fixer Up shows and things like that. You might know that every year, I think for several years actually, HGTV has had what they call a dream home giveaway where they take a house that is supposed to be in what would be considered quote unquote the perfect location and they add all the perfect amenities to this house and then people can register for this dream home giveaway. Maybe you've even heard people say that we've built our dream home or maybe you've been fortunate enough even in your own life to build or to purchase a home that you would call your dream home. And most of the time what people mean when we say that is that the home meets all of our needs. It does everything that we want it to do. Maybe it's in the perfect location. Maybe it has the perfect amenities. Maybe it's the perfect size. But what we think in our minds is that it meets our needs individually or as a family in a perfect way. Our topic for discussion this evening is God's dream for the church. Fascinating title. I know when Jeff gave it to me, my mind went into a lot of different directions. And, and there's a lot of different things that might come to, into your mind when you think about this concept of God's dream for the church. What is the perfect church? What makes up the perfect church? And you know, it's interesting. When you and I think about the church in terms of God's purpose and plan, it is absolutely perfect in every way. It's perfect in the way God designed it. It's perfect in the way that God intended it to be. But as people, we recognize that we're imperfect. So a lot of times, because of our imperfections, we get things wrong. But I do believe that God has a dream for the church. And I believe that you and I can open his word together and that we can see from his word what his dream is for that church. And if you and I can see that dream, then you and I have the ability to take those things that we learn, put them into practice in our lives, and as close as we possibly can, we can help fulfill that dream in a way that makes the church as impactful as God intended it to be. Now, I don't know where your mind maybe is already going when you think about God's dream for the church. But for me, it's difficult not to think about Acts chapter 2. Now, I'm going to ask you to get your Bibles with me this evening together as we study because we're going to be looking at a lot of different verses. There are just a lot of thoughts that I believe come out of this particular text in Acts chapter 2 that we can look at in other places in Scripture that help continue to give us insight into what God's dream for the church is and how it manifests itself in our lives. Things that can encourage us, that can strengthen us, that can motivate us as we strive to fulfill God's dream for the church. Now, I hope you have your Bibles already open. Acts chapter two, let's consider what God's dream includes. The first thing I want us to notice is this, God's dream includes proclamation. I want you to open to Acts chapter two and let's begin uh, at verse number 14. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. 
Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. So you see the apostles, Peter, the rest of the apostles, they have been endowed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And they have stood up to these brethren that are gathered in Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. These Jews that have come from all these various areas across the region to be there for Pentecost. And they stand up and they start speaking because as all these Jews came, they came from different regions and each region had a different dialect or a different language. And they stand up and they start speaking to them in their own languages. And the people thought they were drunk. And Peter stands up to show them, no, these people aren't drunk. And he takes them back to the Old Testament to show them prophecy. But here's what I want you to notice, beginning in verse number 22. Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth. A man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And then he would go on to talk about David and some of the prophecies from the Psalms and how David was still in his tomb, but there was something different about Jesus's tomb. And then he would conclude this powerful message in verse number 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. You ever just think about what that day must have been like when Peter stood up. You think about the type of courage that it must have taken for Peter to do what he did, to say what he said to the very group, some of which were responsible for the death of Jesus. But here's what's interesting. What message did he proclaim? He proclaimed Jesus. Stay in the book of Acts with me. Turn into chapter three. Now chapter three opens with Peter and John healing the lame beggar. But I want us to pick up in verse 11 of chapter 3. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Now, what is he going to say? Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. We see this proclamation of Jesus continue on even into chapter four. Notice how chapter four opens verse one. And as they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed. Why? Because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And even as Peter and John stand before this council, the high priest, what do they do? They continue to proclaim Jesus I think about the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, where Paul says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed it in vain. You see, at the heart of what Peter proclaimed and the apostles proclaimed in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost was Jesus. What the apostles continued to proclaim in Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4 was Jesus. What Paul and the other New Testament writers proclaimed over and over what is known as the gospel account is Jesus, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Even as we stay in the book of Acts and we consider Acts chapter 8, after Stephen has been stoned to death and Saul has consented to his death, Acts chapter 8 says, And Saul approved of this execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. 
Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now notice what happens to the church. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. What is it they were preaching? Look at verse number five. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. You see, God's dream for the church is a dream that includes proclamation, but it's not just any message. It's not just a good story. It's not just something that, that fancies what's happening in the world at the moment. It has been since the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and it will be, no matter how long the earth stands, it'll be the proclamation of Jesus and who he is, that he is the Christ, that he died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose from the dead. You see, I believe with all of our heart that when we look at God's plan, God's dream, that God's dream for the church is a dream that includes Christ-centered preaching. It is a dream that includes his people, not just the preachers, not just the elders, not just the deacons, the entire church proclaiming, talking about, communicating about Jesus. It's Christ-centered and cross-centered in every possible way. God's dream also includes, though, adoration. Go back now to Acts chapter 2. Let's continue in our text. Picking up in verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. The wording there in that verse. It's wording that describes worship. These Christians, they continued in worship. That worship included teaching, it included fellowship, it included breaking of bread, which here in context has reference to the Lord's Supper, and it included prayers. It included those things that you and I recognize as constituting worship. You see, God's dream for the church included this idea that his people would worship him. His people have always worshiped him. Keep your marker in Acts chapter 2. Turn with me to Psalm 95. I want you to look with me to just the opening verses of Psalm 95. Let's look at just the first seven verses of this psalm. Psalm 95, beginning in verse 1. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hands. You see, you and I could go throughout the Psalms and we could find these incredible Psalms that extol the idea of worshiping God. It's fascinating to me how much David recognized the importance of worshiping God. David recognized that without even seeing or benefiting from the full fruition of God's plan of redemption of Christ. David saw the significance of worshiping God even before Christ had come into the world and died on the cross. What did David see that made God worthy of praise? The fact that he is creator, the fact that he is sovereign, the fact that he is ruler, the fact that he recognizes David and he recognized the Israelites as his, his, his people. All of these things drove the psalmist to say, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. You think about the crowd in Acts chapter two. These Jews that had come there for the day of Pentecost, these Jews that had some witnessed even Christ hang on the cross, these Jews that had been pricked in their heart, their conscience had come to recognize that the very Messiah they had been longing for and seeking was the very man that they crucified on the cross. It would seem like life would be hopeless at that point, wouldn't it? What on earth could anyone do to possibly make up for killing the very one that God sent to redeem mankind? 
But Peter tells them there is hope that based upon their rep repentance and their baptism, that they could have those sins forgiven and not just forgiven, but then they could be added to something. They could be a part of something even greater than what the old children of Israel had been. Something new, something complete, something whole. And as a result, their response was one that was based in worship. Worship to God. You think about our view of worship you know, I think there's a danger that we have to balance in our lives. If we're not careful, we can allow the fact that our attendance on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night somehow is a definition of our faithfulness to God. And while I do believe with all of my heart that it is evidence of our love for God and even our spiritual health to a degree, our desire to worship on Sunday is driven out of our understanding and love for God and his grace and his mercy and all that Jesus did on the cross for us. It's not a checkbox that you and I do to somehow feel good about ourselves, to somehow say, hey, I've done it. I've made it to worship on Sunday morning. I even made it back on Sunday night. I've participated in Wednesday night. It is our response falling to our knees, as the psalmist would say, to give our adoration, our worship, to our creator, the almighty, the one that loves us so much, that gave us his son so that you and I can have our sins forgiven and have hope of eternal life with him. Have a confident expectation that if we reach out and accept that gift of grace through our submission and obedience in the same way that these Christians did on the day of Pentecost by repenting and being baptized, you and I have access to that gift and our response should be to worship him with everything that we have in us. You see, God's dream, it includes proclamation. It includes adoration, but it also includes unification. Stay with me, Acts chapter two, verse number 44. And all who believed were together, and I notice what it says, and had all things in common. That almost seems hard to comprehend, doesn't it? You and I live in a world that seems as divided as it possibly ever has been. Whether it's the news, whether it's social media, it seems like more and more is being done to cause division among people in our country, in our community. And unfortunately, at times, that bleeds into and penetrates the church. But God's dream is for a group of people that are not divided, but that are unified. Again, let's look at a passage of scripture. John chapter 17. John chapter 17. In what is one of the most beautiful chapters in all of scripture, you and I are given insight into the mind of Christ, literally ours before his arrest and his ultimate crucifixion. We're not just given insight into his mind. We're given access into this incredibly intimate moment that he shared with the Father in prayer. And I want you to notice with me what he prays for. John chapter 17, beginning in verse 20. He says, I do not ask for these only, his apostles, his disciples. He says, but also for those who will believe in me through your word, through their word. Who is that? That's you and me. Do you ever stop and think about that Jesus prayed for you and for me? He did. It's recorded for us right here in John chapter 17. What did he pray for us? Verse 21, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Hmm. What an incredible prayer. A prayer for unity. A prayer for oneness among God's people. And Jesus tells us exactly why all of this is so important. It's because there's this pattern that flows from the Father to Jesus, through Jesus, and ultimately even to us. 
Jesus's prayer was that we would reflect that same oneness amongst ourselves that existed between Jesus and the Father. And all of this is so that people, the world, may know who Jesus is. Because you see, that type of unity, that type of peace, that type of oneness doesn't exist separate and apart from Jesus. No matter how hard people try, you can't have that type of unity apart from Christ. Again, turn with me to another section of Scripture, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And I want you to consider how. How can we have that type of unity? Because here's the reality of the situation. Every one of us come from different walks of life. We all have different past experiences. We all have different educational backgrounds, socioeconomic statuses. There's different cultural experiences that you and I have. Every one of us have any number of differences that we could point to that would say, there's no way because of all these things that make us unique individually that we could somehow come together and be unified. We're just too different. And in fact, the world would say, celebrate that diversity. And there's some level of truth in that because the, all that diversity that you and I have, our past experiences prepare us to help share the gospel. But there is a sense that you and I should be absolutely one with no diversity whatsoever. And Ephesians chapter 2 gives us some insight in how you and I can accomplish that. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Paul is describing the condition of the Gentiles prior to Christ. They were considered aliens. They were separate and apart from God's people. God's people were known as the circumcision. They looked at the Gentiles as the uncircumcised. The reality is they looked down upon them. There was racial hostility between the Jews and the Gentiles. Notice verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. No longer are you strangers. No longer are you aliens. No longer are you separate from God's people. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both. Jew, Gentile to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. What a beautiful picture. Here are two groups of people that if there were ever two groups that would seem to be at odds and would have no ability to reconcile, it would have been the Jews and the Gentiles. But yet something was able to take them beyond the differences that existed in their past to take them beyond all the tensions that existed between these two group of, groups of people that allowed for them to be reconciled to have peace, not just man to God, but between man to man. All the differences that divided the Jews and the Gentiles were all made possible to be united because of the cross. They were unified. You see, that's God's dream for the church is a group of people that are united in purpose, in cause, in, in proclamation, in adoration. A unified group of people. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. May that be said of us as well. But God's dream also includes participation. Let's keep going in Acts chapter 2, verse number 45. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as many as had need. Wow, what a beautiful picture. I mean, this is not the only place if we flipped over to chapter four, picking up in verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. You see, this unity leads to something. 
It leads to a natural concern and care for our brothers and sisters. What did that lead to then in verse 33? And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of our Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. There's that proclamation. There was not a needy person among them for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to each as any had need. What an incredibly beautiful picture. You see, these Jews that came from these various reasons, they didn't know they were going to be staying this long. But when they heard the message that Peter proclaimed and they responded to that message, they wanted more. So they stayed in Jerusalem. And as a result, some of them had needs because they ran out of money. So those Christians that were there, those Jews that resided in that area that had ability and had resources, they didn't view what they had as their own. They recognize this need to participate together as God's people to meet needs. Again, let's look at another passage, this time in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 is kind of a pivotal chapter in the book. Paul kind of moves from this theological discussion to now with his feet planted firmly on the ground to what is all this supposed to look like in terms of daily living? How do you take everything that he's talked about in chapters 1 through 11 and now put it in application in your life? I want to pick up in verse number 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Now notice what he says, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. This idea of participating together to meet each other's needs was something that didn't just happen in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4 in the church in Jerusalem. It was something that continued on to the apostles' teaching. And Paul says that very thing here in Romans chapter 12 in verse 13. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. And all of this is driven out of a love that's genuine. It's a love that truly cares. It's not hypocritical. It doesn't say one thing and then do something different. I like that word hospitality. It means a love for strangers. And, and in first century Jerusalem and to the first century church, it probably means something a little different than what it means to you and I today. See, for them, they didn't have a Walmart on the corner. They didn't have a Holiday Inn Express if they were traveling. So they truly were dependent upon the, the love of strangers to take them in, to provide for their needs when they were traveling. And that is in part what Paul is getting to here. Hey, when Christians that you may not know that come from other parts of the world, as they come through your area where you live, you show them hospitality. You take them into your homes. Maybe for us, a practical application would be this. Let's not just invite the people into our homes that we know well, that we interact with on a routine basis, but let's make sure that we reach out to the entire congregation, those that may be struggling to connect, those that we don't know as well. And let's make sure we show them the same kind of love and hospitality that we show to everyone. But then notice what Paul says, staying in Romans chapter 12, verse number 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. What a powerful verse. You see, you and I participate in each other's lives. We participate in the good. We participate in the bad. And when, when a brother or sister hurts, you and I are to hurt with them. When they experience something great in their lives, we should be there to participate and to celebrate in that joy with them. I love the picture that Paul paints in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where he describes the church as a body. And he talks about how there's members of the body, there's eyes and there's hands and there's feet. And all these different parts of the body have a different function and a different purpose. And while one may not seem to be as important as another, all of them come together to make our physical bodies complete to function in the way that God created us to function. The same is true of the church. God's dream for the church in order for it to function and be all that it's meant to be requires the participation of every single member. It doesn't matter what your talent is. 
It doesn't matter what your gift is. Maybe you'll never lead singing. Maybe you'll never teach a Bible class. Maybe you'll never lead a ladies' day. Maybe you'll never serve in some particular way. Maybe your ability to serve is making sure that, that the baptistry is stocked and supplied and the linens are clean. Maybe your way to serve is writing cards. Maybe you serve behind the scenes to encourage. Maybe you do teach. Maybe you do lead singing. Whatever your gift is, God says every single member is important. And in order for the church to function and be everything that it can be, it requires the participation of every single member. You see, that's God's dream. Every member, active, finding a role, being involved, sharing together as God's people. God's dream also includes this, though. It includes edification. Verse 46 of Acts chapter 2. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. What a beautiful scene. God's people every single day interacting together. In some capacity, they spent time together every day, encouraging, uplifting, strengthening each other. Man, what a picture for the church. I know things are, have changed. I know that times are different. Yes, those people were together in a relatively small geographical area. They could see each other on a daily basis. I recognize that, that due to the areas that we live in, I live in Houston. I know you guys are a suburb of Dallas. And those are large, large urban areas. And sometimes even to go a short distance, 10 miles, can take a tremendous amount of time depending on traffic. It's not possible always to see another Christian every single day. But here's what's amazing about the time in history that you and I live in. We live in a period of history where we have access to technology that enables us to do things that people that lived before us never even dreamed would be possible. Even what I'm doing tonight, sharing with you a message via this video recording, you and I have the ability to edify in ways that people before us never have. We can send a text message. We can send an email. We can make a phone call. We can still write a handwritten card. You and I can, in any number of ways, reach out to others daily to encourage and strengthen and edify each other. That's God's dream for the church. It shouldn't be that you and I see each other once, twice, three times a week, and we only engage in this four-year level conversation. You know what I'm talking about, right? The four-year conversation. Hey, how you doing? Oh, doing great. How's the family? We're doing good. How's work? Oh, I've been busy. How about you? Oh, we're doing fine. Sports are busy. You know what I'm talking about. Now I recognize that due to the coronavirus, things have changed, but very seldom do we truly roll up our sleeves and really get involved in each other's life. That's where we really start to encourage and strengthen and edify each other. They were together day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes. And they did all of this with a glad and generous heart. They recognized how good God had been to them. They recognized what Jesus had done for them, and they recognized the relationship that they had as God's people. And as a result, they naturally, their natural result of this was to encourage each other. I think about the Hebrews writer. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, a passage that we'll go to a lot to, to, to enforce the idea not to forsake the assembling together. But do you remember why? The whole purpose of, was to encourage one another to good works. That's why we come together as a family. We come together as a family of people to encourage each other. And I think it's possible that we need it now more than ever. As we feel somewhat disconnected by the lack of physical presence due to this virus, we need to be looking for ways to engage each other now more than we ever have. Remember, God's dream for the church includes edification. And then finally this, God's dream for the church includes multiplication, multiplication. Let's close out Acts chapter two and verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. 
And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. You see, God's dream for the church is a dream that includes a group of his people that are constantly proclaiming the good message, the good news of Jesus, that are talking about him everywhere we go, in every setting, work, school, our home life, our social life, at the store, wherever we might be, wherever opportunity opens the door, we're ready to just talk about Jesus. And as we do that, people are going to see our response to God in our worship to him, that nothing will separate us from our ability to worship God, that nothing will limit our enthusiasm and our excitement to worship him because of who he is and what he's done for us. And we're a group of people that's not going to allow society to cause division among us, that we're unified even though we have differences in our background and in many aspects of our life, we are united around the cross in the blood of Jesus because we're all in need of his grace and mercy. And as we come together his, as his people unified, we participate in our lives together, encouraging and edifying one another. And as the world looks at us, they see something that is so different, that's so contrary to what they see in every other aspect of their lives. And their natural response is going to be to want to know more. How do you do it? What's unique about you? How can you live the way that you do? And as we continue to share Jesus, God takes care of the rest. You see, our goal is to make disciples. That's the Great Commission. To go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You see, that's our commission. And as you and I go making disciples, we will baptize them. The Lord adds them to our number, to the church, day by day, just like he did in Acts chapter 2. You see, God's dream for the church is one that naturally produces multiplication, replication. What an incredible picture of the church here in Acts chapter 2. God's dream for the church. It's perfect in every way. And what's left now is for you and I to take that dream and make it a reality in our lives, in our communities, wherever we may live. Whether it's Louisville, whether it's in the Champions area here in Houston, or whether it's in some other part of the world. You see, this pattern applies it transcends time, it transcends history, it transcends circumstances because it's a simple plan based upon God's pattern and his dream. I hope that all of us, starting with me, will take this plan to heart and will do the very best of our ability to live it every day of our lives so that as we engage in the world, they see something unique and special about us and they want to know more about the Lord's church. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Christ. We thank you for the incredible sacrifice that he made on the cross. Father, a sacrifice that we benefit from, a sacrifice that was for us, Father, we recognize that we were the ones that should have paid that price, not him. Father, in that sacrifice, he also purchased the church with his blood. Father, we thank you for the church. We thank you that through our submission to him and baptism that we can be a part of that church today. Father, help us to see your dream for the church as you have outlined in scripture. Father, help us to live it in our lives, to make it a reality for the world around us to see. We love you, Father. We thank you for all that you've done for us, for the great love that you have for us. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. May God bless you and the church at Louisville. Have a great night.